For as long as humans can remember, they have seen, heard, felt, sensed the spirit world. They were strange forms, bizarre sounds, overpowering smells, and unexplained movements. In response, academics, scientists, and enthusiasts searched for tools and technology that would verify their senses. From divining rods, to pendulums, to Ouija boards. They use everything from putting powder on the floor to see if the ghost would leave footprints behind, to setting up threads to see if the ghost would break through them. Their research led to descriptions, theories, and three categories of ghostly phenomena. Poltergeists, hauntings, and apparitions. In German, poltergeist means a noisy, mischievous ghost. Traditionally, they've been associated with abrupt sounds and the unexplained movement of objects. Today, the source of the phenomenon is believed not to be ghosts, but often an adolescent boy or girl with psychokinetic power. And they have an ability, which we all have to some degree, called psychokinesis, mind over matter, that is affecting these objects, that's moving them around. It's kind of like a psychic temper tantrum. The second category, hauntings, have often been compared with a film loop. An event is replayed over and over in a specific location. The location appears to hold a memory of the event. It could be a car accident, a murder, or something as benign as a person walking up a staircase. They might actually see a figure walking down a hallway, they might hear footsteps, but what will happen in these cases is these things are typically in a pattern. In other words, they'll happen again and again and again. The last category, apparitions, are spirits or souls that remain, although the body has left. This may be the most diverse category. What distinguishes them is that they have a consciousness. Apparitions interact with us. You'd be dealing with something like a teleconference where you talk to the TV and the TV talks back. It's the idea that some part of human personality, spirit, consciousness survives the death of the body and can communicate, sticks around, communicates. Descriptions of these phenomena have become more and more accurate. But the source of them remains a mystery. And here's where contemporary ghost hunters hope that high technology will find answers. If there's one group in America that has pioneered ghost hunting and the use of high technology, it's the Midwest-based Ghost Research Society. Established more than 20 years ago, this dedicated team has set new standards for high-tech investigations. I hope to prove here and other places uh, that ghosts do exist, that there is something paranormal going on here. The results of the Ghost Research Society's previous investigations have been extraordinary. They've uncovered a huge variety of floating orbs and light formations that Dale Kazmarak believes are paranormal anomalies. What are most interesting to me, I think, are the ones that uh, really kind of change directions. They really defy gravity. Uh, they will float upwards. They will uh, switch directions very quickly, change directions very rapidly. Uh, very uncharacteristic of perhaps insects, dust particles, stray light sources, or anything else that these things might be. It very well might be spirit energy we're picking up. Uh, it's, it's at least some form of residual energy. So again, these are um, things that we simply cannot explain right now at this point. This time, the Ghost Research Society is at the North Chicago home of Danica Fay. Danica moved in three years ago. Soon after, she began seeing strange things out of the corner of her eyes. And then, one night, in her second floor bedroom, she clearly experienced what ghost hunters would define as a classic haunting. One night, it was really late night, early morning. I was sound asleep, and then all of a sudden, I just woke up out of my sleep, and I look up, and standing in the doorway of my bedroom was just a figure. And I looked away, closed my eyes, looked back again, still standing there, 
and it was a man wearing like a a dark blue uniform and that started the whole thing that experience was followed by numerous other strange events objects moved lights turned on and off pets appeared to see things and while Danica slept something grabbed her feet and screamed in her ear some nights late at night it is a little spooky because you just know someone else is in the room with you and there's really nothing you can do about it it's really hard because I haven't had any like actual proof or anything like that so some nights I just feel like I'm going crazy and just go back to bed and other nights I'm like okay no I know this really happened to me Dale and his team from the Ghost Research Society use a three-step approach to their investigations. First, they comb the location with handheld sensing equipment. They use a negative ion detector to test for static electricity. An infrared-based non-contact thermometer gun for gauging temperature fluctuations. A Geiger counter to sense unusual radiation. And one of ghost hunting's most popular tools, the tri-field meter. It recognizes disturbances in electromagnetic fields. It'll pick up anomalies in energy, in other words, uh, electromagnetic fluxes. Uh, these can be caused uh, sometimes by natural occurrences, but this specific device actually has filters built in that will eliminate a lot of natural occurrences or naturally explained phenomenon. Ghosts will produce some sort of electric disturbance in a home. These devices will pick up these disturbances, uh, whether they be caused by the ghost or something the ghost is doing to the environment itself. Uh, we assume that ghosts can, in fact, produce high energies or high concentrations of electromagnetic energy and even static field discharges in locations, and that's why these devices are very important to us to show areas where these uh, anomalies are occurring. The ghost hunters will target the second floor bedrooms where Danica has had most of her strange experiences. With these tools, the ghost hunters look for unusual readings. Locations they call hot spots. The words. Okay. Trifield meter is really going crazy over in that other room over there. I don't know. Yeah, in the back room, they're picking up a lot of high uh, energy <coughs> readings in the trifield meter. Once we close off the entire upstairs, I mean, there should be not any noise except maybe a, a plane going overhead or maybe a car going by or something. But if we hear other things, you know, it's, for, it's very sensitive. You can see it, it is picking up the sound of, of them walking up and down the stairs and so forth. So it, it's very sensitive. The team then targets their array of sensors on these areas. Most important of all, they focus infrared-based night shot cameras on these hot spots. With their equipment in place, Dale and his team wire everything to a bank of monitors and a computer on the ground floor in the kitchen. To lessen electrical interference, they turn off the fans, the air conditioner, all the upstairs lights, and watch and listen for unusual activity. Are we ready, Dale? Yep. On this night, the temperature is a hot and muggy 85 degrees. The team could wait hours for nothing. They never know. After 50 minutes, there's still no activity. Everybody's here. What's going on, Dale? Sounds like something's moving around up there. Then the truly unexpected happens. I've been noticing that for the last uh, couple of minutes here. No, there ain't nobody up there. You can hear it right there, you can hear it shuffling. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know, can you see that flying? You hear that? Yeah, you hear that? That's, there's nothing moving. There's no one up there. Huh? There's nothing moving. The blinds are not moving. While everyone was focusing on the monitors, looking for orbs, they've heard some unusual sounds. Sounds that are growing louder, louder. What's that? I don't know. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> that's not the normal, normal noise. Where's you know? the dog? The dog's down here. The cat, where's the cat? Did you turn the tuning down? 
Oh, you hear that? Yeah, I heard it. And that's definitely upstairs. That's not outside. It's too close. That, that sounds like it's right in the same room with yeah, the. Yeah, it uh, does. Same room with the FM transmitter. That, that would be the north bedroom. Something's walking around up there. Yeah. Moving things around. Look at that. You can see it on the scope. Right. Dale and his team are clearly recording sounds of footsteps. Is that better? Dale sends two team members upstairs to look for an explanation. You hear anything up there? Uh, While the team members move around upstairs, Dale can compare the sound of their footsteps with the ghostly sounds they just recorded. Walk around that room a little bit and shuffle your feet a little bit. Is that what it sounded like? Yeah. Yep. It sounds very similar. Upstairs, the search has found no explanation for the sounds. A window in the room had been open, but there are no metal blinds there that could have caused the sound. Then, the orbs appear. We just saw our first, uh, looked like a uh, gl glowy ball or globe of some kind in the uh, number two camera, which is uh, stationed across the, uh, from the washroom. It was on the floor. Fairly short-lived, only a few seconds, but uh, similar to ones we've seen in the past. Over the next 45 minutes, five other orbs glide through the screen. We just got another hit just right, just right there, too. This one comes from right to left, down. She comes in the room and goes straight down to her right side. This one goes up her leg. This one kind of floats up in this direction very slowly. There went one right there. Solid? Yeah. And that was in the a pretty bright one, too. Eight hours later, Dale Kazmarak and the Ghost Research Society team have completed their investigation. The results are in, and the findings are extremely unusual. Well, we found a lot of interesting things on the videotape, including strange lights and uh, objects that floated through the screen. Uh, we also heard some strange sounds upstairs, including shuffling of feet, uh, what appeared to be uh, movements of, of objects or something. We heard like crashes and, and um, different types of sounds indicating there's something going on upstairs. I would assume that they may all be related in some way, that there may still some, be something here paranormally uh, in the form of a spirit or a ghost. Over the coming months, the Ghost Research Society will continue to investigate Danica Fay's home. They'll look for a source for those sounds and these strange images. And that's okay with Danica Fay. She's glad to have confirmation that what she's been experiencing is real and surprisingly undisturbed at the thought of continuing to share her home with one or more ghosts. Now the ghost doesn't need to go away. He can stay. He doesn't do anything. No harm. So, as far as I'm concerned, I can live like this. Well, from our perspective, really, uh, these haunted houses are like are a theater of the mind. That is. Uh, unconscious mental states are now out in the open. For some ghost hunters, paranormal phenomena are external, outside forces caused by life after death. Dr. William Roll, a professor of parapsychology, and Dr. Andrew Nichols, director of the Florida Society for Parapsychological Research, have another explanation. They believe ghosts and ghostly phenomena are the projections of sensitive minds living in unique environments. It's like dreams that are coming out in the open. Instead of being internal dream images, now they're out. And it just it went like that as if somebody was behind it pushing it, like if there was a resistance or something, and then it just scooted. A perfect case in point is the incredible story of Doretta Johnson. Since 1987, when she moved into this Madison, Indiana home, Doretta and her family have been frequently threatened by poltergeists and apparitions. Unexplained fires, rooms being wrecked, nobody been in them, um, glass breaking, dishes flying from the cabinets, just 
There was a long list of things that would happen. After months of searching for explanations, Doretta sought the help of Dr. Roll. He got to know Doretta, got to know the house. Let's say a number of cells coming together. Now, Dr. Nichols has joined the investigation. Uh, you mentioned that there were poltergeist type effects in this room, objects would move. Um, you had dishes that would come out. What, which cabinets were they? Mostly this one. I see. And would they break when they came out? Stuff would break. Um, one situation we had people over and we were standing and talking and they were getting ready to leave and <laughs> the cabinet doors flew open and I had bread in there, which I always have bread, and the bread, bag of bread opened and bread just started flying out. Even more frightening than these bizarre poltergeist events are Doretta's terrifying visions. One of them occurred while taking a shower. As the water hit her face and neck, she smelled something putrid, fumes of something dead and decaying. Doretta then looked up, but instead of seeing her bathroom ceiling, she saw the sky. And I smelled earth, um, just dirt. And I looked around, and I wasn't in the shower anymore. I was in a hole. I was, I think I was in a grave. So, I mean, there was some charge, electrical charge going on, but finally I, I, I almost fell out of the shower. And when I did, and I grabbed the towel, I looked down, there was blood on my legs. And there was claw marks on my legs. And um, they weren't painful, but they were there and they were deep. And they were on my ankles and, and parts of my legs. Ron saw it. Her husband, Ron, ran into the bathroom, threw back the shower curtain, and pulled Doretta from the tub. There was blood oozing down from her ankle. And they were pretty good little cuts, you know. It was like, or just like somebody took their hands and just took fingernails or just dug right in, and she was bleeding pretty good. Despite all of these experiences, Ron resisted believing anything unusual was happening. Then, one day, Ron saw for himself when a psychic visited their home. The psychic asked to use their restroom. Suspicious of a trick, Ron followed him and waited in the hallway. So I kind of stood there in the hallway and watched, and there was a shadow that stepped out of the wall and stood there in front of me, maybe six foot tall, totally dark, you couldn't see through it, but it looked like the torso of a man standing there. And he stood there maybe just a few seconds, but it seemed, you know, forever. And he just took a step back into the wall, and I couldn't speak, I was trying to get Doretta, she had done seen it too. My reaction was total elation. I yelled and jumped up and down because finally he saw something. What's causing this unusual activity? Both Dr. Roll and Dr. Nichols believe it's a combination of two factors. Doretta's sensitive mind and the unique electro and geomagnetic properties of Doretta's home a home situated above an underground water stream and below the intersection of three sets of electrical power lines. Our hypothesis is that, that the experiences that have been had in the house by Doretta and other members of the family really uh, essentially is due to the, uh, or is triggered uh, by, the, um, by these fields. To test their theory, doctors Roll and Nichols want to examine the electromagnetic properties of the house. They'll try to connect them to Doretta's electrical conductivity and her brain activity. Dr. Nichols begins by taking measurements of the household energy levels. To do this, he uses a specially designed geomagnetic field meter and an electromagnetic field meter. What I'm uh, measuring now are the electromagnetic fields associated with uh, household current and the high voltage power lines outside and so forth. There are two different types of magnetic fields that we measure. Electromagnetic fields which are generated by household current and high voltage power lines and that sort of thing. And then also geomagnetic fields generated by the Earth itself. That's what I'm looking for is fluctuations in the Earth's magnetic field that may correspond to areas where these events occurred. What Dr. Nichols discovers is significant. A typical home's electromagnetic field level is 2 to 10 milligauss. Doretta's is 130 milligauss. A normal home's geomagnetic field level is 50 milligauss. 
Doretta's averages 440. Anything over 10 milligauss is considered to be potentially harmful and could potentially trigger these types of effects. And we've got 131 milligauss in this room. This house this, and the land that the house sits on seems to be an electromagnetic hotspot. It is, um, it is the location of uh, very unusually high electromagnetic and geomagnetic fields. And these are the conditions that we find are particularly conducive to ghosts. Dr. Roll likes to refer to them as, as hatcheries for ghosts. After measuring the electric and geomagnetic fields, Dr. Nichols progresses to Doretta's electrical conductivity. He attaches a sensor to her finger to measure Doretta's GSR, or galvanic skin response. What GSR actually measures is the permeability of the skin to an electric current, its skin resistance. And the lower it is, then the less resistance there is in the skin to an electric current. Then, to examine Doretta's brain activity, he attaches electrodes that connect her to an electroencephalogram, a device which measures brain waves. They'll pay particular attention to her alpha waves, brain waves associated with psychokinetic powers. 240? Yeah. Doctors Roll and Nichols ask Doretta to place herself in a deep state of relaxation. Then they wait and watch the computer monitor. 20 minutes later, the doctors gather the data. They find some surprising and perhaps revealing results. A typical galvanic skin response is as much as 175. A relaxed person has a GSR of 80. Doretta's is zero. I've never seen a human being that has a zero GSR before, uh, which means that you, you are a very, very good conductor. It may indeed be the key to her ability to focus these energies, to channel these energies, because she's able to conduct electric fields through her body with virtually no resistance. Also remarkable is Doretta's brain activity. The EEG has shown that Doretta has an exceptional ability to place herself into a relaxed state of mind. She was able to enter an altered state of consciousness very rapidly, uh, which is indicative of uh, the type of, uh, of brain configuration that we find in people who are psychically sensitive. The results suggest that there is a unique relationship between Doretta and her home, that her sensitive mind may be amplified by the unique properties of her environment, that Doretta may be actually projecting these bizarre events. We can speculate that these fields bring on these states in the occupants, in particular in Doretta, and perhaps uh, in this way uh, facilitate her uh, unusual experiences, her unusual access to the unconscious. I think that the whole house has served as a, as a kind of a biofeedback machine for her. I think of it like being a TV screen. I think I can pick up channels and it seems real bizarre until you think about a television set. It picks up waves and that's what I have a tendency to do. I pick up waves. I got the neatest thing on your eyes. Oh, they're just shining back at me. Ooh, you're a demon. <laughs> when I was younger, I was kind of a weird kid, but I couldn't imagine myself out trolling around graveyards in the middle of the night with a tape recorder. For most contemporary ghost hunters, seeing is believing. But for Chris Peterson and Nancy Kimball, hearing is believing. They're the founding members of the Utah Ghost Hunters Society. Their interests are apparitions and the ability to communicate with them through EVP, electronic voice phenomena, a recording technique that allows paranormal researchers to hear ghostly communications embedded in everyday sounds. I think you didn't need to have everything, you know, lots of scientific uh, knowledge or equipment to do it. You could just go out and anybody could do it. I mean, if it's there, let's prove it. Let's see if we can get it. And that's what we did. Very peaceful place. Are you, most of you at peace? It's just really, it's exhilarating. It's exciting when, when you get really good 
uh, contact. Over the last few years, they've gone on hundreds of ghost hunts and come up with thousands of extraordinary EVP. One was at a Utah Pioneer Cemetery. There's some sparkling on this headstone. A lot of these people, families were buried together and you'd see four or five, six children that never made it to their first birthday. A lot of them that didn't make it to their first week of life. And I was saying how sad it was, being a mother, how sad it would be to lose children just one right after another. And we had a very sad voice of a woman that said, I am so sad. At another cemetery, they spoke to a reluctant spirit that was looking for their headstone. Just as I'd said, oh, come on now. We're not going to hurt you. To hear this little voice. It's, it's, it's just amazing to hear that there is somebody still around looking for something here in this life. We'd love to find Miss Stowen. I'd love to find Miss Stowen. We'd love to find Miss Stowen. And the interesting thing was at that time they were changing all of the headstones from the upright headstones to the ones that were on the ground because it's easier to mow the lawns. So obviously this poor soul had... Uh, Missed his stone. Didn't know where it was. Sometimes the spirits were threatening. We hear all different kinds of things. Uh, sometimes we hear whatever you want to say they are. Uh, angry, obnoxious. They don't want you there. They want you out. And then generally when we get that answer, we get somebody saying, go away, get out leave us alone, or sometimes we just get these horrible growls. Tonight, Chris and Nancy have a new challenge before them. They've traveled from Utah to California. They're about 90 miles south of San Francisco in a coastal town called Brookdale. Their destination, the Brookdale Lodge. The lodge is owned and operated by Leanne and Bill Gilbert and their daughter, Jennifer. Jennifer has often seen ghosts. I'm so used to it, I almost feel like it's a protection. I feel like there's someone protective watching me. There's always been the same sightings of a little girl. I've seen images that are running and the sound of feet running. And then when I go to look out to see who's there, there's absolutely nobody there. I've seen a little girl walking through the top, the upper level, and just dis disappear into thin air. Built in the 20s, the Brookdale Lodge was a celebrated hangout for Prohibition-era gangsters. They came for the bootleg whiskey and the unique design, a design that featured an actual brook flowing through the dining room. At its peak, the lodge hosted celebrities like Joan Crawford, Tyrone Power, and Marilyn Monroe. Over the years, though, the lodge fell on hard times. There was a fire and a flood. In 1984, it closed. In 1990, the Gilberts, along with their daughter Jennifer, purchased it. They knew about the lodge's ghostly history especially the stories of a little girl ghost named Sarah who drowned in the brook. They also heard reports of a ghost in the pool area. A lifeguard confirmed the stories. And she was inside the pool and I guess she was closing up and she heard a big splash. She looked all on the bottom of the pool. She thought maybe someone was at the bottom. There was nobody there. There was a ripples in the pool. Something had definitely dove in. She was pretty shook up about it. And she came down here and we kind of laughed it off and said, oh, it's just one of the ghosts. You just have to get used to it. At the Brookdale, it hasn't been only what people see. It's also what people hear. One night, late, Jennifer and bartender Elan Galboa were closing up. While clearing glasses and putting away chairs, they heard the sound of a party in the adjacent brook room, complete with old-time dance music. It was a 
was totally weird. It was scary too because we thought that it was a bunch of kids with um, stereo or something, you know, broken into there. We walked over and we opened up the door and right when we opened up the door everything just came to a halt. It was one of the strangest things I've ever experienced. Brookdale Lodge in California. We just want to say hello. Is there anyone that would like to speak to us? Is there more than one person here? Can we invite you to speak with us tonight? Armed with an audio cassette recorder and external microphone, Nancy and Chris are in search of EVP and evidence of ghosts at the Brookdale Lodge. I would invite you to speak, but you will have to speak so that we can hear you if you'd like. Their recording technique is basic. They ask questions and pause, waiting for responses. Responses that at this point are inaudible to human ears. We know that there's been someone here. We'd love to hear from you. Can you give us a name? Can you tell us why you're still here? The next morning, Chris and Nancy take their recordings into a remote audio laboratory looking for what is known as ELF, extremely low frequency voice recordings. Okay. What we're looking at here is most of what you see up in here is, uh, is the sound of the river. Down in here is the, uh, the voice itself. And you can see down in these lower bands here, if I zoom in on it, the lighter colors. This is a very uh, low frequency sound. The colors tend to be very cool. Down in here you have orange and yellow, which is where the actual, the, the voice is embedded. Human voices are normally heard in the sound frequency range from 300 to 3000 hertz. ELFs are found in a lower range, from 1 to 300 hertz. That's a physical impossibility for the human voice. It's not somebody walking around off camera calling things out. With the aid of audio editing software, Chris searches the tape for sounds in the ELF range. Sounds that might be voices. Once he finds a section, he uses the computer sound editor to filter, amplify, compress, and stretch the sound. CVP 12.81 hertz. Right. It's too low to be a human voice. We got it. This part right here is probably uh, the sound of the river. That's here. Okay, what we're actually looking at on this scale is the highlighted section right here. So this is the very first part, and as you go through, you have the rest of the the sound bite right here. It sounds like yeah. a little girl's voice. Nancy and Chris appear to have recorded an EVP of a little girl. Could it be the voice of Sarah? But this is only the beginning. Three weeks later, Nancy and Chris complete their analysis of the Brookdale Lodge. They post a dozen new EVPs on their website including a strange howl. A man's voice saying, come over here. And a woman's voice saying, help me. Though the meaning of these statements is still obscure, it seems clear to Nancy and Chris that there's a little girl spirit that is trying to speak to them. It's kind of sad that some people choose to stay and talk with us instead of moving on. I guess I have a religious belief that there is something more and it's just basically saying yes, here's the proof that we have that it does go on.
Have you heard about the website called discovery.com? Discovery.com is my guidebook for life. I learned how to plant an herb garden, train my dog, and cure my dandruff. I learned that most meteors burn up in Earth's atmosphere. Ah! The atmosphere! Ah! ah the atmosphere! Ah! Friday night on... One of the ladies had a child with her, a little boy who was three years old, and he broke away from his mother and ran out into the hall, started up the stairway. And by the time she caught up with him, he was already coming back down. He said, I don't want to go up the stairs. There's a ghost up there. When I was concentrating on shelving books. I had longer hair then, and I was wearing long, dangly beaded earrings, and I felt someone come up and pull my hair back. And I thought, oh, they're looking at my pretty new earrings, and so I turned to see who it was and there wasn't anybody there. They call her the Lady in Gray. And for more than 60 years now, she's been haunting Evansville, Indiana's Willard Library. The first sighting was in 1937, when a night janitor was in the basement firing up the furnace. One night he went through into the unlocked portion to stoke the furnace at three, about three o'clock in the morning. And he uh, dropped his flashlight raised up after he dropped the flashlight and he saw this form in gray, gray veil, long gray dress, and it just melted away before his eyes. Also, the ghost has often been sensed in the children's reading room. Librarian Ann Wells remembers her first encounter with the lady in gray on Halloween day in 1990. My noticed a fragrance, a strong smoky fragrance, something like incense. And when I would step two steps away it would be completely gone and then I'd come back to that area and it'd be very strong. And it didn't dissipate slowly like an aroma does that lingers. This was like turning a light on or off. Over the decades the hauntings at the Willard Library continued. Sometimes she was seen other times, objects moved without explanation. But no one in Evansville worried. She is um, a gentle, benevolent, and protective spirit. No one has ever been frightened by her. Today, a new technology will enter the halls of Willard Library. Paranormal investigators hope to prove haunted locations like the Willard Library have a unique electromagnetic signature, a signature that haunted locations everywhere may share. Paranormal investigator Tim Hart heads the team working with an experimental technology called MESA. The purpose of MESA is to look at electromagnetic fields, um, the whole electromagnetic spectrum and see if there are differences from haunted places to non-haunted places. MESA stands for Multi-Energy Sensor Array. Using eight different sensors, it measures light from infrared to ultraviolet. It measures vibrations and electromagnetic fields and static electromagnetic fields. At the Willard Library, Tim and his team plan to target two areas where the Lady in Gray has been seen most often. The first is the children's reading room, and the second is the basement hallway near where the furnace used to stand. I would say the one hypothesis I do have is that at haunted places there are rapid, uh, sometimes wild fluctuations. For the next 30 minutes, Tim and his team lay the cables and sensors for MESA so that they cover the basement and children's reading room. 60 minutes later, MESA has recorded its data. Tim and crew prepare to print the charts. Sensor type for channel one. Which was that? IR. That was infrared? For red. Okay. Two. Okay. What was the pull up for channel one? The IR sensor for basement? Basement hall or story pit? Basement. Basement hall, yeah. they're both on 100. Okay, so 100K. And the first few reports are unexceptional. Okay. There are some changes, but I wouldn't say they're real drastic. That's kind of normal. 
Oh, wow. Yeah, look at that one. Then, on the north-south electromagnetic sensor, they get some extraordinary data. Then this one, which looks very interesting to me. Whoa. A lot different. Than that this. one's. That's, that's really super yeah. interesting. It's, let's see. Mm -hmm. Because that, uh, there's... Uh, it goes to like things. negative four or negative three yeah, up yeah. to... Uh, that would have taken It place. goes from four and then down to negative, negative three. Negative three. That one's, that this, one's kind of the, interesting. The, the, the earmark of something that's, that's, that's a legitimate fluctuation in the magnetic field is when it's both sides of the axis when we when it's not drifting one when way it goes or the other. up and, and then down negative as that's well. what we're seeing here and that so. that occurred at point one hour which is about six or seven minutes mm -hmm. that's where so we, we get the most interesting wanna... results the team has found unusual electromagnetic fluctuations in the children's reading room that's, that's, that's really, a pretty that's big really fluctuation because yeah. people could probably still sense a, a jump like that in an, in an earth field and they may interpret that you know yeah. differently I mean everybody's yeah. different and but it may they may you know sense something could be the sense presence we've talked about or uh, maybe an apparition or uh, yeah. a touch on the shoulder or something like that yeah. the team finds even greater fluctuations in the basement near where the old furnace used to be whoa yeah, that's, that's even a bigger deal than the first one. That's the, it's the same exact orientation that we got on the other one uh, yeah. with a, a big fluctuation. Yeah. Tim and his team have shown a genuine connection between physical phenomena and ghostly phenomena. The lady in gray can actually be correlated to physical data. With the evidence from the Willard Library, Mesa may be well on its way to defining a measurable signature for ghostly phenomena anywhere in the world. And the staff of the library may have proof of a ghost many of them knew was real. I feel like I'm the visitor. This is her space, and she's allowing me to work here, and uh, somehow I think she approves of my work. We work very hard to make children love reading, and uh, she approves of that. She allows us to do that. This is her spot. We're visiting. I don't mind her being here, as long as she doesn't scare me and she never has. We like the legend, we like having her here. Corporal form. Are they projections of what's already in our mind? Are they trying to communicate with us? Or are they just the stuff of fantasy? The answer is still unknown. It's clear though that each year our fascination increases and our ghost hunting tools improve. And someday our age may just be considered the very dawn of ghost hunting. It would be naive for us to think that this short space of time that we live on Earth is our total existence. There must be something beyond this time. It's natural. And that's the one thing I want to, to prove, that it's not supernatural, it's just part of our world. It draws a great mystery. It's, it's learning something you have a curiosity about. And people have a curiosity about the unknown. We also fear the unknown. And so what we fear we want to know about. It's how science has continually progressed. It's a mystery to be solved. Purchase a home video of the program you just saw. Call now to order. For only $19.95 plus shipping and handling, you too can become part of the adventure. Journey to our world's farthest corners and beyond.